Pope, Honorable Judge of the Supreme Court of India, Honorable Justice Mahesh Sona, Senior Administrative Judge of the High Court of Bombay and Goa, Honorable Justice Makaran Karni, Judge, Honorable Judge of the High Court of Bombay, Mr. Devidas Pangam, Honorable Advocate General for the State of Goa, Professor Dr. R. Venkat Rao, the Vice Chancellor of the India International University of Legal Education and Research at Goa, Dr. Sudhir Krishnaswamy, the Vice Chancellor of the National Law School of India University. It's our honor and privilege to welcome all of you for this symposium today on this topic, co varis Legal Education, Futuristic Scenario and the Way Forward. This event is a three-day event on the 8th, 9th and 10th of December. A program specially organized for the upcoming lawyers at the bar. It's a program which involves training, advocacy skills, court craftsmanship and articulating your views, your submissions and the legal program. The whole purpose of organizing this event is one view which we see of the legal profession is in the institution where the seed is sown. But once we move out of the institution, the practicalities of the profession present the realities of the profession. So the whole attempt of organizing this three-day discourse was to combine academics with practice. Keeping this in mind, our trainers from Mumbai with the association of the Bombay Bar Association are undertaking the exercise of training our young lawyers over the last two days, yesterday, today, and will be culminating tomorrow. But also, it is important to understand the way forward in the legal education. And it is with this purpose in mind that this symposium is organized today to give a sense of direction to all of us in the legal profession. I would like to request the President of the Goa High Court Bar Association, Senior Advocate Sri Zilman Coelho Pereira, to formally welcome all the guests and the dignitaries for today's function. So can I request you? Judge of the Supreme Court, Mr. Justice Mahesh Sora, Mr. Justice Makaran Kami, Mr. Devidas Pandam, Professor Dr. Venkat Rao, Vice Chancellor of India International University of Legal Education and Research, Professor Dr. Sudhir Krishna Swami, Vice Chancellor of National Law School of Indian University, my senior colleagues here present principals and faculty members of law colleges, law colleges here present, my esteemed colleagues at the bar and students of law colleges. At the outset, let me personally welcome and thank each and every participants of today's symposium, Honorable Mr. Justice Abayo, for having informally, promptly acceded to chair this session and be present with us here to give us the remembrance of the pleasant and fruitful times which he devoted to Goa while sitting and presiding the bench in Goa. I felt this was one of the occasions when I could remind you, sir, that the Goa Bar has always you in mind for your courteous attitude to the members. I must also thank Mr. Justice Karnik for being here with us again after sitting here for nearly four months. I felt that we would have him here in a different capacity to continue his contribution to go to go a bar in the state. I must also thank Mr. Justice Sonak for having been always prompt to cooperate with us in any of the endeavors of the association. I express my profound gratitude to Professor Rao, who in fact postponed his engagement elsewhere to be present here. I am told that he has a flight after this event. I must also thank Professor Krishna Swami for having accepted promptly our invitation.
expectation without any fuss or fast or difficulty and for having agreed to be here and share with us his progressive thoughts on legal education last but not least i must also thank my good vidas pandam for being here and as always being a great support to to the association at the outset let me tell you why the committee decided to have this symposium on the topic who avoids legal education the way forward as you are all aware the goa high court bar association in collaboration with the bombay bar association is engaged in a training program to newcomers in the profession who have completed between 0 to 5 years of practice the program is to give this young and upcoming lawyers a feel of proceedings and behavior in court it's a three day workshop for a group of 30 lawyers who are being instructed by 10 trained trainers mainly practicing lawyers who are imparting this training to the core youngsters i have waited this opportunity to thank each and every one of them i have waited this opportunity to thank the president of the bombay bar association my esteemed colleague mr nitin takkar and mr vishal kanade general secretary who were, who were here and could not be present now for some other again i would fail in my duty if i have not mentioned mr akash rebello who have been the driving force in making this workshop happen with the help of three colleagues from the local bar mr rui bamish pereira mr varun mandankar and mr bernard fernandez as the training program was meant for the legal education after graduation we thought of coining this symposium with this event as we felt that the sequence could not be complete if we do not have the views of legal luminaries and scholars on the day tell us of education of lawyers before entry in legal practice and after and what would be the way forward to meet the challenges of time people in the country regard law as a concern of lawyers judges law is changing day by day law is a social control it has a primary aim of social welfare it is an instrument of social change it assumes importance in india from the point of view of legal education namely people training law and ethically equipped to render services not only to the literate and rich but also to the illiterate and the poor after the british rule was started by the east india company the legal profession was also started gradually the western civilization culture education administration of justice system which were introduced in india substituted the centuries old old age hindu dharmashtras and puranic injunctions and amended them to suit the changing times legal education and development have become interrelated in a modern state among such legal education speeded nationalism our country produced great lawyers like motilal nehru jawalal nehru mahatma gandhi mc sarkar mc chagrai and many others in fact the legal education changed the indian political and administrative setup East India Company introduced the British system of judicial court proceedings from the very beginning in 16 not not charters of 1726 and 1753 established the mayor's court the supreme court at calcutta was established in 1774 by the regulation act of 1773 the governor generals of the time introduced several judicial reforms when there were no indian trained lawyers other than barristers that came from london as there was then no legal education in india only rich people could avail the legal services of barristers there was a great need the hindu college in calcutta elphinstone college in mumbai and madras introduced introduced law courses in 1885 for the first time up to the 19th century only males were allowed to study law courses in the beginning of 20th century ladies began to study legal courses in india the legal education in the country took off after 1947 the wider scope of getting employment in the fields 
such as legal advisors in industries, chief funds, finance companies, press legal practitioners, judges, teachers in law colleges, administrators, affiliated to legal, legal education. The number of colleges started growing after 1947. The Constitution of India has been the basic pillar for promoting legal education. The University Education Commission was established in 1948. The Commission gave its recommendation on legal education and All, All India Bar Committee was established in 1951 with the aim and object of inquiring the defects in legal profession. Amongst other things, it recommended for a uniform qualification for admission to the role of advocates that it ought to be a law degree after attending a certain percentage of lectures for imparting education during apprentice course. It also recommended a legal education committee. The All India Bar Council was constituted to give recommendations for improvement or in legal education. The first law commission was constituted in 1955. The commission was entrusted with the works pertaining to all fields of law. The first law commission recommended and suggested recommendations for development of legal education. Based on the report of All India Bar Committee, the Advocates Act 1951 has been enacted. Much waters have flown in the legal universities, the first one being the National Law School of India University. We have the privilege of having Dr. Krishna Swami with us, the President Vice Chancellor, and the past Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Rao, who still has stamina to contribute more and more to our legal system. I think I have exceeded my welcome brief. Pardon me, Honorable Chairperson, condone my action, and I wind here giving you the platform, sir, to tell us where is the legal ed education going, and tell us the way forward. We have, besides the legal fraternity here, principals and faculty members of, of, of state colleges who are, I'm sure, will take adequate views from today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your welcome. And uh, the eye opener is what we say. I request our member, Ryan Minages, to now formally introduce our speakers to this office again. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have with us today a galaxy of speakers who come with the pleasure of both knowledge and experience in law, who have graciously taken the time out on this weekend to share their wisdom and their perspectives with us. It is my privilege to introduce these eminent speakers to you today. Our first speaker, Justice Abhay Oak, he graduated uh, with a degree in law and was enrolled as an advocate in June 1983. He practiced law at the Bombay High Court from 1983 onwards, appearing in several important matters in a, in a range of areas. He is elevation as a judge of the Bombay High Court in August 2003. In May 2019, Justice Oak was elevated as the Chief Justice of the High Court of Karnataka. And on August 2021, he was elevated to the Supreme Court of India. We I request the President, Mr. Goyal Pereira, to escort Justice Oak to the dance. Thank you, sir. Justice Mahesh Sonar, a lawyer practicing at the Goa Bar, was enrolled as an advocate in 1988 and practiced at Goa in a variety of areas, civil law, constitutional law, labor and service, environmental law, commercial and tax law, company law, and so on. He has held, he has private, practiced both as a private, uh, private advocate and as a Standing Council for the Central Government, Special Government, uh, Council for the State Government, and as 
counsel for statutory corporations. He was elevated as a judge of the High Court in 2013 and currently serves as the senior administrative judge of the Goa bench. May I request Mr. Shailen Bobe to escort Justice Sonak to the dais. Justice Makran Karnik graduated in law and was enrolled as a lawyer in 1991. From then, he practiced at the Bombay bench of Bombay High Court in civil law, criminal law, labor, service, and constitutional matters. He was engaged as a senior counsel group to, to represent the government of India and also represented the High Court administration from April 2009 till his elevation in 2016. Judge, Mr. Bench of the Bombay High Court. May I request Mr. Gauri Shakmi to escort Justice Kandi to the dance. And look at Devidas Pangam. The Advocate General for the State of Goa has a practice of more than 25 years at the Goa bench of the Bombay High Court in a range of matters, constitution, anti-defection law, service, mining, taxation, environmental law. He has, in the course of his private practice and as Advocate General, appeared in many important cases and has brought forth many landmark judgments, several of which have been reported. As Advocate General, for about the last two years, he has ably represented the cause of the government of Goa. We have request Advocate Nigel Kostov to kindly escort Mr. Kangal to the rest. Our next speaker, Professor Dr. R. Zenkar Tarao. Is currently the Vice Chancellor of Euler at Sankar Goa. A stellar career, he holds a BA, MA, MA, PhD, and LLB honoris causa. He has served as Vice Chancellor of the National Law School of India University, of the Vivekananda School of Law and Legal Studies, the Vivekananda School of English Studies, and as he joined Euler in 2023 as Director Consultant and assumed office as its Vice Chancellor in March 2023. He has been, he served on the statutory bodies of several law schools and on the Board of Governors of the Indian Institution Addresses and several other honours which include a gold medal for the best PhD thesis from Andhra University in 93, the best researcher award from Andhra University in 2003 the Best Teacher Award from the Government of Andhra Pradesh in 2006, the Best Vice Chancellor Award for Outstanding Contribution to Education uh, during the World Chancellors and Vice Chancellors Congress 2014. He has authored six books and more than 130 papers. He has guided three LLB candidates and up to 19 PhD candidates. He was also the chairperson of the Board of Governors for the Asian Law Institute. May I request of Mr. Ram Rivankar to escort Dr. <laughs> Dr. Sudhir Krishna Swami holds a Bachelor of Arts in Law from the National Law School of India University, a Bachelor of Civil Law from Oxford University, and a Doctor of Philosophy in Law from Oxford University. He currently holds office as the Vice Chancellor of the National Law School of India University and is the director of the Department of Professional and Continuing Education at NLSIU. He is also the co-founder and trustee of the non not-for-profit research trust Center for Law and Policy Research. Previously, he was director of the School and of Policy and Governance and professor of Law and Politics at Azim Khan University and has been a Rhodes Scholar and graduate of the Oxford University. 
These areas of interest include constitutional law, legal system reform, legal theory, intellectual property law, and administrative law, and he has written on a wide range of topics. He has several publications to his credit in the area of law. May I request Mr. Sudin Uthamkar to escort Dr. Krishna Swami to the dance? May I now hand over the stage to you? My dear friends and esteemed colleagues from Bombay Airport, this is Mr. Sonar, this is Mr. Pandi, Mr. Devilas Pangam, Advocate General of State of Goa, Dr. R. Vikatara. And Dr. Sudhir Krishna Swami, Mr. Koyo Parela, President of the Bar, Mr. Agni and other office bearers, very distinguished senior members of the Bar and other members of the Bar who are present amongst us, academicians and students. I must really compliment. Goa High Court Bar Association for taking this initiative. I must confess that uh, I am here as a member of the legal fraternity or somebody who is part of the legal fraternity for 40 years, 20 years as a lawyer and 20 years as a judge. But I am not an academician and therefore I have my own limitations when I address you on this subject. Legal education in India has seen drastic changes from the 80s. I joined law college, the government law college in Mumbai, which is the oldest law college in India in 1980. The law education in those days was completely different. The law course was understood only to be a part-time course. We are used to have maximum two lectures in a day. There were no extracurricular activities, if I remember correctly. I was sharing this with my colleagues today in the afternoon when I was here. We used to have maximum one moot court competition throughout the year. In fact, I must confess that in those days, it was very often said that those who cannot secure admission to any other better courses, or then law used to be the last resort. I must listen to that and I was not one of them, but that was the fact. In fact, I remember my friends and colleagues in government law college. There are hardly few who had decided to practice law. We had uh, retired government employees who wanted to do something after retirement. I had many colleagues and friends who were doing chartered accountancy or cost accountancy or company secretary posts. And they were there as seen as an additional qualification. I want to tell for the benefit of uh, young students who are present here that I remember my days in government law college where we used to have only two lectures in the morning and we used to spend our rest of the day at three interesting places nearby. One was, of course, Bombay High Court. And I was privileged in those days to see uh, H.M. Sivori addressing a full bench. I I could understand as a lawyer. His second best place was British Council Law Library. The British Council Library, which was very close by. And third, and perhaps more interesting, was Mankhead Stadium, where we could spend two days and see Law's current Ishwara in action in Andy Prophet or Guru Prophet. Thereafter, the things started changing and I must say, as uh, the president said, that the first change was in 1986. That was with the establishment of National Law School in Bangalore. And we must all give credit to Professor Madhava Menon, who really changed the course of legal education in our country. I mean, so much can be said about National Law School in Bangalore. And, uh, 
I think National Law School Bangalore was the first university to start five years course, subject to correction in 1988. Till 1988, all courses were part-time three years courses. And today, we are fortunate to have one ex-vice chancellor and present vice chancellor who have continued the old and grand traditions of Professor Madhu Amina. Advent of national law schools gave a different dimension to the legal education in India. And after national law schools started, uh, five years course, and there are so many law colleges, many law colleges, they started five years course. Till 80s, even thinking of having a full time course in law was another law. I remember in those days, members of the bar council used to demand their course any change in the law course. Even the full-time course was being remedy opposed because their contention was that it will prevent common man from taking legal education. But fortunately, uh, things changed. And I can say that from late 80s, the talent started coming back to the law. Because suddenly, you will find from late 1980 or early 90s that in leading cities of our country, legal profession became most lucrative profession and perhaps that was one reason why talent started coming back to law and now we have those competitive examinations like uh, CLAT or all states have their entrance examinations which are very very competitive and today we have a large number of colleges, large number of law colleges, private law schools uh, which we see today. Now we are talking about legal education in future. Now there are several issues associated with the legal education and uh, it is for the academicians to look into it. The education and uh, it is for the academicians to look into it. The National Law School in Mumbai. Now in my capacity as Chancellor of MLG Aurangabad, I am associated with the law education and therefore I see a number of difficulties. Now the first and foremost issues which we have to deal with in future is about availability of trained law teachers. We have 2008 regulations, 2018 regulations of University Grant Commission. The regulations provide that for even assistant professor, you need a master's degree of 55% marks and you require that net set qualification, state level or national level entrance test or PhD for associate professors and for professors same qualification with some addition. So today nobody can teach in a law school or law college unless he has a master's degree with 55% marks and net set or PhD. The result is you take case of several national law schools, you take a case of several law colleges, you will find that there is a dearth of teachers. All law schools and law colleges are appointing retired people or those who are not qualified on contract basis. This is one area where perhaps the academicians cannot apply their mind. As a student of law, for their benefit, I want to say something. For becoming a good law teacher, is it necessary to have postgraduate degree? I will give an example. I am told that late Mr. Nani Palkiwala, Justice Chandrachur, Senior Chandrachur, and many distinguished lawyers were part-time lecturers in government law college. When I was in government law college, perhaps these regulations were not there. We had very senior and distinguished members of the bar who were working as part-time professors. Now, mind you, Senior Justice Chandrachur and Mr. Nani Palkiwala, Nani Palkiwala, arguably one of the greatest lawyers India has produced, all of them had only one law degree, that also two years, uh, in those days, there were two years early course. Today, when I was uh, a law student, so many members of the bar, those who were practicing in citizen court in Mumbai, those who were practicing in high court, they are very distinguished members of the bar. All of them were teachers and we were immensely benefited by their presence. 
Therefore, in every conference of bar council which I attend, I always tell the bar council that look, please go to university grants commission and see and see that these regulations are amended. I am not saying that those who wanted to want to be appointed as assistant professors or associate professors or professors, they should not have this kind of a qualification. They should have, but at least there should be some regulations which go, which allow senior members of the bar, very distinguished members of the bar who are interested in legal education to become part-time lecturers. Unless, unless we have this kind of a facility, we have a scenario where, like most of the law colleges, where the law management struggle to appoint the professors. I, I will give you one example. I gave example of the oldest law college in India, the government law college in Mumbai. For 12 years, with so many advertisements, we could not appoint a regular principal. And we were faced with such a situation that we used to depute our senior district judge to act as a principal of that great institution. Because we don't get raw teachers. Maybe these qualifications may be issued, or maybe in Mumbai there were other problems like people found it difficult to secure accommodation, etc. But in future now we have to seriously consider whether we can amend the UGC regulations and allow senior members of the bar whose experience will be extremely useful to the law students to contribute. Now, as far as qualifications are concerned, it is a domain of uh, University Grants Commission. When it comes to standards of legal education, now we have uh, the rules of legal education framed by the Bar Council of uh, India. Now, in those uh, rules, now there is a compulsory clinical course, and there the Bar Council say that the assistance of lawyers and retired judges can be taken to conduct those courses. One more serious issue which we have to think about in future, which I have always raised. We talk about legal education. Now, what is the object of education? One object of education is you acquire knowledge. And one may not be intending to practice law, but Nothing wrong if somebody feels that I must acquire knowledge. I want to know what are the laws, I want to study the laws. So this is one category of students will go for this law course. But majority of the students who are going to law course, they go with the intention of practicing law. As a lay person, as somebody who has worked in the legal field for 40 years, I asked a question to myself, yes, now in the new regulations, new uh, rules of legal education, there is a compulsory uh, clinical course. I also noticed uh, from that, uh, that uh, there is uh, one heading of moot court exercise and internship. And there is also one clause that observance of trial in two cases, one civil and one criminal, 30 marks are assigned out of 100. Now this comes under the... Uh, the practical experience training. I am referring to this for a different reason. If we have best possible national law schools in India, there are private law schools who are really imparting quality education. Take the case of Bangalore, for example. I asked a simple question to myself. A fresh law graduate of best possible legal institution comes out with his degree, goes to the bar council, takes his salam. If he is told to conduct a simple trial for offence under section 279, or a simple trial of offence under section 138, this a promissory note. Will he be able to conduct the case? The answer is no. Compare this with the medical course. Medical course, the, the, the uh, MBBS course, the student underwent very rigorous training, he has to attend the clinics. So maybe after he passes out, uh, he gets MBBS degree, does his one year internship. When he comes out, he will be able to uh, deal with, he will be able to treat some smaller diseases like common cold, uh, cold maybe influenza. But he is capable of doing the work, capable of discharging his duties as a professional. This does not happen. I have been repeatedly talking to Bar Council. I, I refer to this, observance of trial in two cases. If you are sending a student to, uh, to a particular court for 15 days, 
I wonder whose student is going to observe a trial because trial, the life of trials is long. Though section 309 of CRPC provides that once the session trial starts, it has to continue and end. That is not happening because we don't live in an ideal world. So I don't know, 30 marks are given, observance of trial in two cases. Which trials the students observe? They are supposed to submit a report. By going to a court for 15 days, you are not going to observe the complete trial. We need to work upon this aspect. Maybe with the permission of the High Court or Supreme Court, we should record the proceedings of trial where very eminent members of the bar conduct the trials. Or proceedings of uh, High Court where very eminent members of the bar argue a criminal appeal or a civil appeal. And that can be really, those skills can be shown to the students. There is also a provision for internship. There are no guidelines for internship. What the students are supposed to do? If they go and take internship in the chamber of a judge, every judge gives them different kinds of assignment. There are no rules, there is no pattern. So we need to work on what is the meaning of internship, what we are supposed to do. Everyone deals with interns in a different manner. I have different method. I make my interns. So this is one pattern, but there is no standardized pattern. And therefore we really need to work on uh, uh, these aspects. Therefore, in what manner we can improve our legal courses, our law courses, so that those who want to join the legal profession, they should be equipped to start a legal profession. And so many students are here. All of us were lawyers. My experience is the same. For one year, I could not understand what is happening in the court. Though I was a student of one of the best law colleges. There is one suggestion which was made by a very distinguished judge. I attended one such workshop. He said that uh, you know, why there should not be two different categories of law degree courses. One for those who want to practice law and the other for those who don't want to practice law. They are doing that course for different reasons. To acquire knowledge, to acquire additional qualification, whatever it is. So if you want to have very equipped lawyers to, to be created by all these law schools and law colleges, perhaps uh, we have to think on those terms. It's for the academicians to discuss that. The other issue which we have to consider in future, Goa, I believe, has how many two law colleges? Goa? Two or two law colleges. Right. But if we go to the neighboring state of Karnataka or neighboring state of Maharashtra, we will find that in all major cities there are 15, 20, 25 law colleges. Talking about Maharashtra, every city even new cities like New Bombay have now eight law colleges. So there are a number of law colleges which are coming. And the standard of education, they are all affiliated to different universities. The standard of education in each college, if you go to Nagpur, the standard is different. If you go to Bombay or Pune, the standard is different. Now, one very good experiment which is successful, that is, I think, in the state of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Now, you know, some paramedical colleges are affiliated only to that state level medical university. Same experiment has been done in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, and I believe in some more states, where there is one central university for the state, and all law colleges in the state are affiliated to that particular university. They are not affiliated to individual universities. That will perhaps streamline the quality of education in all the states. So there are issues and issues um, which uh, require consideration. I am only Lagging those issues as a lay person, somebody who is part of the system for 40 years. But I know that the view of academicians will be different, and we want them to express their views. And I'm sure that there are uh, teachers in law who are sitting here, they are principals of law colleges, they will also apply their mind. So uh, I'll request uh, uh, Brother Justice Mahesh Sonar to share his views. Honorable Justice Pope, thank you for coming to Goa and thank you for all the passion you have towards this subject. Brother Justice Karni, Devilas Kangal, our Advocate General, Dr. Rao and Dr. Krishna Swami, respected Vice Chancellors, President Jalman Kuel Pereira, Senior Advocates, my dear friends, and dear students. 
the expense of law is so great that one never ceases to be a student of law. Each day, you only discover how much there was that you did not know. In a sense, therefore, legal education, or for that matter, any education, is a progressive discovery of the magnitude of one's ignorance. We stay on the earth, but we must learn as if we were to live in eternity. The concept note which was given to me by Mr. Pereira correctly flies the impact of digital revolution on the legal profession. The digital revolution naturally has not spared the legal systems and the legal institutions of which we all are but a part. One of the biggest challenges for the 21st century lawyer would be to embrace this digital revolution, but without abandoning the core values or the core fundamentals of our legal profession. The digital revolution has completely overwhelmed us. Unlike the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution, the change that this revolution has brought about and is continually bringing about is neither gradual nor is it predictable. Coping with such immense changes continually taking place at a very great pace can be stressful, particularly to people like us who have already reached their 60s. Legal education will therefore have to equip the 21st century lawyers to cope up with such stress levels, constantly reinventing themselves and alternating between learning and unlearning. It was Albert Toffler who said that the illiterates of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. Emotional intelligence must also be a part of the curriculum in the law schools. I think it is necessary. Yuval Noha Harari, in his 21 lessons from the 21st century, writes that from time in, in the first part, a person accumulates information, develops skills, builds a suitable identity. In the second part of his life, such a person relies upon his accumulated skills and evolved identity to navigate the world, earn a living and contribute to the society. However, the immense and unpredictable changes coupled with longer lifespans will make this traditional <coughs> model completely obsolete. Whatever you learn today becomes obsolete. So you have to unlearn, learn afresh and so on. To give you an example, the debate about whether machines could render humans obsolete gained prominence in the 1980s at the onset of the digital revolution. <coughs> at that time, one of the arguments against obsolescence was met with the example of facial recognition. It was argued that even babies are adopted to facial recognition, but the most powerful computers on the earth, then available, were not. Today, we take facial recognition software almost for granted. In the 1980s, it was said that no computer would ever beat a human at chess because it was purely a mind game. In 1996 itself, the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue defeated the world chess champion Gary Kasparov with relative ease. At least I knew Amazon's Kindle as a book reading apparatus storing several books digitally. But I did not know that Kindle is able to and constantly collects data from users while they are reading the books. It can now monitor which parts of the book made you read fast, which slow, on which page you took a break, and on which sentence you abandoned the book never to pick it up again. I now hear that Kindle is upgraded with facial recognition and biometric sensors to record which portion of the reading the books. Now friends, please imagine the impact of such a software on the relation between, say, lawyers and judges. Imagine, for instance, the advantage to a lawyer who has access to information on those aspects of their pleadings or legal arguments that most resonate with the judge. Imagine if lawyers were to access information about the type of arguments that appeal to a particular judge 
or about or the arguments which were carefully considered, pondered, or those which were dismissed without a hesitation. Friends, kindly note that algorithms are watching you even at this instant. They are watching where you go, what you buy, or who you meet. They are monitoring your steps, all your breaths, and all your heartbeats. They rely on the big data and machine learning to get to know you better and better. And once the machines know to, and once the machines get to know you better than yourself, they would obviously be equipped to control you and even manipulate you. There would be nothing much you could do about it. In the end, it is a simple empirical method. If the algorithms indeed understand what is happening within you better than what you yourself understand it, then the authority will shift to them. Analyzing a judge is no longer the stuff of some science fiction movie. I understand that in the US, there is already a software which analyzes the probabilities of the side on which a judge may lean regarding a particular issue based no doubt on the data bank of previously decided cases, writings, speeches, life history, etc. Computers now not only have great amounts of data, but they have vastly superior ability to marshal and evaluate such data in the scientific export and to prepare the next generation to cope with challenges that they have never encountered before, such as super intelligent machines, engineered bodies, and have a clear about what you want in life. If you are firmly grounded in values and traditions, but if you are not clear, it will be easy for technology to take control of your life. With the pace at which technology is advancing, you might find you might increasingly find yourself serving technology instead of technology serving you. Friends, have we all not seen several people on the streets glued to their smartphones? Have we not experienced genuinely smart law graduates? Even refusing to look at their acts, trying to understand what the section says, trying to interpret that section, but rushing to their smartphones to find out scores of precedents on that subject. Do you really think that they control technology or is it technology controlling them? Friends, Martin Luther King in a slightly different context said in the early 1960s that our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and misguided men. Therefore, whilst I do not dispute in the least the inevitability of assimilating technology in our lives, it would be a sad day if we were to mortgage our ability to think and our ability to make intelligent and sensitive choices to a machine or an algorithm. It would be a sad day if we atrophy our thinking faculties and wipe out completely the difference between a human being and a machine. I am conscious of the school of thought that argues that there is no harm if the humans cede their intellectual autonomy to technology. Perhaps the time may prove them right or wrong. All that I say is that these are matters which should be thought about. They are pros and cons deliberated. These are not matters which we should accept without any discussions or discourses, simply because they are presently expedient. Friends, we may not be able to control the winds but we can surely adjust our sails. As it is, we live in an age which is extremely proud of its machines like thing, but extremely suspicious of humans who even are humankind of its humanity. You may regard me as old-fashioned, but I do think that legal education will now have to go to the basics and re-emphasize that the practice of law is not a business, but it is a profession. It is a noble profession in which Finer elements of public service, creativity, sensitivity, compassion, consciousness are not mere irrelevancies. This profession is concerned and concerned intimately with humans in flesh and blood, with emotions and psychology. The litigants and the briefs are not some raw material in an assembly line set up by a lawyer or a firm of lawyers. Therefore, personally, I am a little alarmed when fresh graduates speak about startups and marketing strategies. I may be wrong in my discomfort. I may be reeling under the influence of an outdated bias. I genuinely do not know. All that I say is that legal education must at least be alive to such concerns and address them and then move on. Gone are the days when legal education would bombard law students with loads of information 
or data. Their memory was put to test more than their capacity to reason. With the march of technology, that would be unnecessary and even superfluous. The focus must now be on principles. Not just existing and established principles, but if necessary, challenging the established principles and evolving new principles. The focus must be to encourage creativity and critical thinking. The focus must be to inculcate virtues of independence and courage. These are essential to the making of a good law. And I do not know whether technology is going to be of great help in helping the lawyers to cultivate these essential traits. It is only with the capacity to think clearly, independently, fearlessly, that a student mass media tools that are growing powerful every hour. A few decades ago, the world was at war against WMDs, weapons of mass destruction. Today, television, social media, or mass media have become the new WMDs, weapons of mass distraction, not destruction. Friends, the virtues of courage and fearlessness go a long way towards making a good life. Courage is the greatest of all virtues, because if you have no courage, you may not have the opportunity to use any of your other virtues. It was Thomas Jefferson who famously said, that one man with courage is the majority. Physical bravery is admirable in certain circumstances, but they say that physical bravery is primarily an animal instinct. Moral bravery is much higher and it takes courage. Friends, let me digress a bit, but I must say it today that right from the day I was appointed as a judge, Justice Oak, who is with us today, literally mentored me. He taught me as well as several other judges that he has mentored by his example. Justice Oak has several praiseworthy virtues, but one of the best virtues that appealed to me was his fearlessness and courage in the most of trying times. And let me tell you friends, that there were several such trying times from which he triumphed with utmost grace and dignity. And what was important? without the slightest hint of any bitterness or rancor or acrimony. Friends, I always think that Josiah Gilbert Pollard, who wrote his famous poem, was written to quit Justice Oak and permit me to quote it. It says, God give us men a time like this demand, strong minds, great hearts, true faith and ready mind. Men whom the men who possess opinions and a will, men who have honor, men who will not lie, men who can stand before a demagogue and damn his treacherous flatteries without a winking, tall men, sun-crowned men, sun men who live above the form. This is Oak, I do not know in Delhi whether we can, in Delhi today we understand that it is very difficult to live above the fog or the smog. But we are very proud that Justice Oak from our court has lived up to these lines which Josiah Gilbert Holland has written. And now it is imperative that legal education strives to create such lawyers and such judges like Justice Oak. These virtues of courage, honesty, free and independent thinking or creativity can never be outdated or outmoded. They will remain or must at least remain essential attributes of a good lawyer. Unless, of course, we collectively decide that legal practice need not continue as a noble profession, but it can very well be accepted as a business or a money spinning venture, where unfortunately a different set of ethics can be applied. Therefore, legal education, even for the 21st century lawyers, must while equipping such a lawyer with all the boons of technology and globalization, strive to see that such lawyers remain anchored to values, core values, and virtues that are essential attributes of a good lawyer. These views may sound outmoded, sentimental, and not worldwide. I do not wish to be judgmental, but all that I say is that make a hasty judgment. Do give these aspects the benefit of deliberation and even a debate. Then if they are to be buried, so be it. 
at least such thoughts would then have the satisfaction of a decent and a dignified burial. If I have sounded a little pessimistic, let me tell you that pessimism was never my intention. I am extremely proud of our digital revolution. I have no doubt that our generation next has a bright future and the capacity to make the future even brighter. We must look to the future because that is where we are going to spend the rest of our lives. I have firm faith in the virtues of humanity and humanism and the resilience of, man, of humankind. Some of the concerns expressed by me will cease to be concerns if we, if we embrace technology with an open mind. But at the same time, if we do not sacrifice core values like consciousness, sensitivity, professional ethics, creativity and courage. I thank the High Court Bar Association for organizing today's function. They do great service by organizing such functions and the several functions that they have been organizing for the last few years. There is a complaint against those of our generation that we may not have left much of a future for our youth. That may or may not be correct, but such functions show that we are at least making an effort to prepare our youth for the future. The efforts of the Goa High Court Bar Association, the efforts that the Goa High Court Bar Association has put in to organize this program and the very presence of Justice Hope and Justice Karnik in our midst and the respected Vice Chancellors, despite their extremely busy schedules, is a sure testimony to this commitment. Thank you very much. His Lordship, Honorable Justice Abayo, my dear young lawyer friends, law students, good evening, one and all. When I was told about uh, the topic for the symposium today, it's who uh, are the way forward. Uh, and when I came to know that there are uh, so many young lawyers and law students present. So I thought this is the best possible opportunity for me to give you all a detailed lecture on this topic. But then uh, I could have preached so many things. But then yesterday in the papers I learned, I read that uh, judges are not supposed to preach. <laughs> so therefore my entire exercise as a uh, you know, I'm in a bit of a problem. I can't offend the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, friends, let me see this. We heard the uh, erudite speech of uh, Justice Sonak, and I completely agree with what he said. I may not be able to say so many things in the same uh, tone and uh, in such a well said manner. I try to put it in a, as rustic way as possible. In my own personal opinions and no preachings here. Well, uh, to make up, make my point, I may have to go back uh, in the past history. Because we are discussing the way forward into the legal education. So we cannot forget what the past has been. Well, uh, it all started uh, like this. That uh, I look at it like this, that uh, the dispute starts when two persons are fighting, both of them say, I am right. Now, the law students, the students are here, so I put it as simple as possible. So they say, I am right, he says, he is right. Now, who is to resolve this? So in olden times, these disputes would go to the king who was the monarch then. And uh, he had this big garbat where he used to uh, sit on a mighty throne and uh, which was uh, placed high up, the pedestal. And uh, he would listen to the grievances of both the sides. Both the sides trusted him. They had faith in him. And ultimately, he would decide who is right and who is wrong. And they would gladly accept whatever is right, whatever is the decision. 
over a period of time, the responsibilities of the king increased. And therefore, slowly the system of courts came up uh, step by step. And then we have this system where the judges still sit on the high pedestal. This to uphold the majesty of the law. And there is a purpose behind it. When two parties come, later on due to the complexities of so many uh, matters, when two parties come before the court, the parties and persons were unable to put forth their grievances sometimes due to illiteracy, sometimes due to the complexity of the matter, and therefore they had to engage councils, legally created councils. Now these councils owed a duty to the court. They had to be abreast with what the law is. They had to make their submissions in a manner which behoves a council of that court. And that is how the practice of uh, presenting submissions by the lawyers before the judge, respecting the courts, respecting the majesty of the court, it all started. And the judges, then and even now, they are, they, the, the people have given faith in them and started accepting their decisions. This is of course subject to the hierarchy of the courts when we have appealed, when we have uh, at the last uh, uh, in the Supreme Court. So this goes on for some time. Now all this is uh, all about an open court hearing which we have, which has been going on for times in immemorial. Now this of an open court hearing. Now uh, today for convenience, of course during COVID times and all, we did face a lot of problems. And for convenience, we have the facility of a video conference. And therefore, because it is convenient for the lawyers, they would appear through video conferences. But the question is, are we really doing justice to by appearing through video conferences? The reason is this. I'll put it as simple as possible. Well, uh, there's some misunderstanding somewhere. Then uh, take a case where there's a misunderstanding between two friends. The friend will go to another friend and say, why do you have a misunderstanding? And he'll say, that please try to hear me out. This is the reason what happened. Without hearing me, without doing anything, you have formed an opinion of, about me. Please don't do it. This is what it is. And then the friend will say, either he'll be convinced or not convinced. But he has that chance and this is called a, a, a very important concept called as an opportunity. Every person has a reasonable opportunity of presenting his case. And a personal, there is nothing more important than a personal opportunity. This happens best when you are in a court of law. So I would implore all young lawyers, before, before you adopt to this uh, video conferencing facility, please try to come to the court as far as possible and make out the case. It helps you better. It even helps the judge understand the case better. Of course, in a given case where it is impossible for you, you may resort to the facility of a video conference. It is there for all of you. It is for convenience. Now, the video conferencing is really working. But for who? Now, the lawyers have gone through the grind of a lawyer. They have been part of chambers. They have been trained by their seniors. They have seen what law practice is. And thereafter, when the time came, they could easily adapt, it, adapt to video conferencing. But so is not the case with uh, the young lawyers who are yet to be trained. Uh, in Lordship, this is what we are... Uh, we take pride in saying that we are products of the appellate side of the Bombay High Court. Now, what happens in the on the appellate side? What happens in the bar room? Bar room is a place where we get to rub shoulders with all the senior lawyers who are sitting there. And it is there that the senior lawyers watch your conduct. They watch how you are uh, uh, doing in the profession. When you are in an open court here in many times, as junior lawyer, when I have faltered so many times, and even there are. I must give you an example where uh, I was uh, uh, appearing in one matter before Justice Goda and uh, he was handling me left, right and centre. Fortunately for me, my senior lawyer of the Bombay High Court was sitting next to me. And during lunch recess, he came up to me and told him what is happening is not correct. And he gave me that confidence. He told me these are the submissions you have to make. Please make your application in this particular form. The senior happened to be just his own. Now, this is what happens in, the, in an open court hearing. Uh, I'm sure you're lucky to remember that incident. It happened in courtroom number 40. <laughs> had it been a case I had appeared through video conferencing, the, where would that have left me? No senior to guide me, nothing. I would just uh, uh, have argued with the camera, 
said a few, remembered a few things, taken a hit from the uh, senior judge, and that is it. And in the afternoon, suddenly the table turned, and the judge could see my point. That is because we got that assistance. But this is what happens when you are in a badu. There are seniors who will always see, uh, they will ask you, what are you doing? What are you reading? You can go up to them. Now, what happens is, what happens when you all have your spanky offices? The seniors are in their offices. They are comfortable attending to video conferencing. Where, 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 where does it leave the junior noise? This is where I am really concerned with. And when you bring in technology, the technology has to be, before that, first inculcate the best practices of this profession. Now, I'll give you an example. Of, uh, and I'll join the issues with what uh, uh, His Lordship uh, Justice Abhayu just said about uh, the great legendary Mr. Nani Palkiwan, about his qualifications. Do you need to be highly qualified for delivering justice? According to me, for the purpose of delivering justice, one must have a robust common sense, which is not very uh, common nowadays. Now, uh, there was this uh, Chief Justice of India who thought I must have a feeler of what happens at the ground level. So he thought that I must go around the villages and see how the justice is being dispensed with at the village panchayats by the panchayats. So he went to one particular gram panchayat and he saw the sarpanch of that uh, village. He was resolving the disputes within no time. The chief justice said, when they have tremendous faith in this sarpanch, so he said this sarpanch is very unworthy respected and he is very fair. These are the attributes of a judge. And the next point he said, but uh, when he has uh, nothing with him, she said, that is the reason why justice can be dispensed with so fast. Because he doesn't have statutes, he doesn't have rules, but he has robust common sense. With him. And he has that independence, that fairness. In him. These are traits and attributes of a good judge. But as lawyers, you have all these statutes, all the rules, everything with you. Please be abreast with all the facts. In the morning, uh, all of you must have heard uh, his doctrine this is folks speak about how the lawyers should train themselves, the young lawyers should train themselves. And uh, this is where we have to inculcate these best practices in us as lawyers before we really uh, venture into this adventurism of technology. When I say this, I say this with a full sense of responsibility that something that has been gone on in open court hearing for times immemorial, immemorial should not be tinkered with and uh, 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 the very foundation of this system, you know, getting disturbed in the process. We must think about this for the future as well. Bring it very slowly, as slowly as possible. Now, since young uh, students are here, I would just like to, you know, uh, uh, away slightly and put something to you. Uh, please treat this as an exercise. When as lawyers, you have to, you know, one, you have to think on your feet as justice, who can sit in the morning, Secondly, you have to look at the matter from different uh, dimensions. There are n number of dimensions the matter can be looked at. Now, from the social perspective, I would uh, I, I would present one case which uh, was uh, you know it, it is a case uh, which was argued in the Bombay High Court. The facts were somewhat like this: uh, there was a very good family, a family comprising of a husband, wife, and a, a child eight years old. Now the uh, uh, husband would go out for work in the morning, come back late at night. Sometimes he would be away for three, four days. Unfortunately for the wife, she developed a fondness for uh, a neighbor with whom she had uh, an affair. Now, uh, one fine day when the husband was not there, the, uh, the neighbor, the wife and the son, they went, went to one park. And at the park, the son saw something. Now, the son was very disturbed. Now, seeing that, both of them panicked suddenly. And to save himself, the, uh, the neighbor, he killed the son. They are in, in front of the mother. The mother became unconscious. Now, after she becomes unconscious, the, uh, uh, the neighbor runs away. The police come, the investigation starts. Then the mother gives a statement, this is what has happened. The uh, neighbor is arrested. Over a period of time, what happens is, the, uh, the parents of the, uh, this uh, lady, they desert her saying that you should not have, you have taken away our grandson from you, you are a wretched lady and uh, henceforth we have no, uh, nothing to do with you. Now the, uh, 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 the man is inside in jail, he sends a message, look here, there is nobody to look after you, I am the only one, helpless lady goes to the court and turns hostile. She says there were some other persons also and this gentleman was always with you. 
there is nothing he has to do with this body. And he walks away spot free. What I want you all to think in this is, who is right in the process? Is this lady who deposed against her own son is right? Are the parents yeah. right who deserted the uh, lady when she wanted her most, when the, the daughter when she wanted the, uh, the daughter when she needed the parents most? Or is it the husband who uh, influenced her? Is it the society which didn't protect this? This is something as God's students you have to think about the matters from different dimensions. And this is what the beauty of this profession is. And therefore, though there are national law schools, you, are, you will get good degrees, you will uh, all be uh, uh, immediately engaged in corporates. I would implore and urge you, please come to this profession. This, this profession is very dynamic. There is a liveliness every day. I will conclude and we will do this object. Thank you so much. I request uh, Mr. Devidas from the advocate to express his views. Good evening to all of you. Today, for this symposium amongst us, we are privileged to have the Honorable Supreme Court Judge, our own High Court earlier judge, the Avayo. We are very proud of him and we really cherish him as a judge of the Bombay High Court. Uh, we have Justice Mahesh Sonam. Uh, we all know very well. We have Justice Karni, who has recently sat here and uh, did a wonderful job as a judge. Mr. Rao, who is the Vice Chancellor of Isla. Mr. Mr. Swami. I will straight take up the issues which have been raised by his lordship because time is a relentless thing. But before that, let me congratulate the Elder person from Goa Bar for having taken such a wonderful initiative. I don't, you know, they came two months ago to Yulan Goa to have a discussion that day for more than a couple months on the water supplementary, including the title Go Valleys. And they have taken the initiative to organize a program on a day which is just 24 hours before the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Tomorrow we are going to have Human Rights Day. Quality legal education is the best guarantor of protection of human rights. The second issue is, my Lord was referring to Mani Bhattiwala. It was on 11th December 2002 that Nani Panchuala completed his voyage on this planet. Important. And what a way to celebrate okay, those two things by having this wonderful seminar served by him to thank you. Straight away going to technology, I'm reminded of Steve Jobs, who said just before his death, how happy and peaceful was life. But actually, we were just two. <laughs> Clearly, sending a negative signal that technology need not dehumanize. Technology has shortened the distances, but in, remember, the human relations have been stretched. In. And my question to my friend is that India has a tradition of producing brilliant lawyers in spite of law colleges and not because of law colleges. A Daktari, a Panchiwala, a Shatlavar was an exception. So when there was an increasing concern for the quality of legal education and poor delivery system, a star was born in Bangalore. A jewel in the crown of legal education called the National Law School of India University. That was in 1986, that is the third generation I say. But National Law Schools were also branded as the elitist. 